All right, we are very much live. Thank you guys for joining us. Brad Seaman with the Seaman team, Keller Williams, Jason Yoss, Golden West uh, Management. I always say Golden West Property Management, but that's incorrect, right? I said it right the first time. You're right, but we do do property management, so you're on the right track. Okay, so I'm not too far off there. Uh, thank you guys very much for joining us uh, today. We really appreciate it. This is something that Brad and I had talked about a little while back about uh, kind of circling back to this issue uh, or this new law that we've uh, heard is coming through down the, the grapevine. So uh, a, a AB 828, I believe it is, uh, is a new law that if I read this correctly, uh, will essentially allow a tenant to petition the court to have their rents reduced by up to 25% uh, because of the coronavirus. So uh, I know you guys aren't attorneys necessarily, but you follow this very closely. And did I kind of hit the nail on the head there, Brad or Jason? Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, you know, the, the bill 828, I think is, has two major things going with it. Uh, one is it's, it, on the cover, it talks about having a moratorium on evictions and uh, mortgage payments, mm -hmm. um, or excuse me, on foreclosures and notices of fault on mortgage payments. Uh, but the reality is this 25% rent reduction is a big piece of the bill. And, um, you know, not necessarily from a political perspective or, or anything else, but just the way that this will impact landlords as well as tenants. Um, it, it's kind of a scary thing that it's, it's making this blanket statement. So uh, let's pick apart some of the issues and talk about, you know, what, what the bill really reads. Yeah. And I, after looking at the bill, one of the things that stood out to me the most, and I think is a, the most kind of just, uh, it's very bold. Uh, it's not a very good plan in my opinion is to say that someone can have their rent reduced, uh, it, it basically forcing the, the landlord to re reduce the rent, uh, without the tenant giving any cause. And I, that's not a very, that doesn't fly uh, very well with our current legal system because you have to show reasons for something like that. You have to show hardship. Uh, Jason, do we have anything else in the property management sphere uh, or in, in tenants' rights or, or, you know, something against landlords that you don't even have to show a reason for? No, and uh, the bill lists material hardship as, defines it as a host of things simply to do with uh, that don't have to be defined at documentation wise. And that's really scary. It allows a judge or judge pro temp to basically sit there and decide if you had a hardship between March and whenever a local emergency order was declared uh, that it most likely is due to COVID-19. Yeah. And usually what it comes down to is the burden would be on the person who's making the claim. Correct. And there isn't really you know, you, you might be able to still make the claim, but usually you need to substantiate that claim as well, uh, which is one of the things that kind of stood out to me as uh, being the most, um, it, it's just non-traditional in our, in our typical legal sense. It's not what we normally see. Uh, Brad, what else did you see in this bill that kind of made you, gave you a little bit of pause? Well, I'll, I'll second Jason's comment about um, really not unsubstantiated reasoning for having a hardship in the market. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we're all being impacted in some way, shape or form, but there's not really any definitive benchmark for what a hardship is. Yeah. And so th that's the, that's the scary part is that, um, you know, number one is a tenant can claim a hardship without necessarily having one, one, but also landlords aren't really being backed in any way. They're not being supported. So um, many of our homeowners in San Diego that rent out their properties are barely breaking even on their mm -hmm. homes. And if we have a 25% reduction in rents, um, I've talked to several people that won't be able to carry it. They won't be able to keep their home and they'll have to either sell or go into default on their mortgage, which they're not really being backed up there. Yeah, and we've had other kinds of uh, suggestions as far as help or assistance for uh, people who can't pay their rent, can't pay their mortgage. Um, and does the, the more, so let's kind of get into that too, because I think that's adjacent to this bill. Does the mortgage or uh, potent, it's a potential mortgage moratorium, I think there was a rent one recently. Jason, can you talk about that a little bit? There's a couple. It extends all the way from every level. It's starting with the CARES Act at a federal level all the way down to, say, City of San Diego, for an example, stated that all rent had to be paid through May 31st, and then there was a moratorium on when that rent had to be due back. It gave like six months. So 
but they're very general statements. They don't cover all the nuances and details. And as you've alluded to and Brad alluded to, there's a lot that goes on between the left and right lateral limits of, okay, we'll just pay it back by September 25th. Yeah. And, and if, I mean, so what does that mean exactly? Do I, my office that I have, uh, you know, my rent is not too cheap. Do, do I not have to pay my rent? Do I not have to pay my, my rent to my, my landlord? And not everybody's covered. It doesn't, you, you know, are you a federally backed mortgage like a Fannie or Freddie Mae, or are you a, a private mortgage that may not be covered under the CARES Act? Are you a commercial building? So, you know, again, politicians roll out a lot of sweeping um, general bills or directives, but there's a lot of devil in the details. And so it's tough for the public to wade through and are they covered? Are they not? And residents, the same, they're not sure are they covered or are they not? And so that's a difficult thing that we, we work through with our landlords and tenants. So, and I know there was a moratorium on uh, evictions. Is that correct? Like you can't evict anyone for, I think it was 60 days. Uh, again, each each rollout has a different time period. Like CARES had 90 days. But for example, right now, the courts are closed. So you can't file anything right now. So uh, what are we looking at? You're, you're the attorney. When are we going to open up, Justin? When are we, when are we going to file again? Maybe, maybe a month. Uh, it sounds like they're, they're taking steps to kind of soft open things back up. But it, just because you, and you might be able to file by just sending something in, but at the same time, it's, it's kind of, up in the air but the the whole goal with these bills is to make sure that it's nothing is you know arbitrary or or open and you and you need to have something that's a little bit more clearly defined and so when you say something like oh i i have a hardship well that's extremely subjective and who's covered well some might be covered by this some might be covered by that and that's unfortunate because in this time where there's a lot of people who are afraid out there we need a little bit of a better answer, you know, and uh, Brad and I talked about this a couple of weeks ago about this bill. And there's, there's things that I don't like now, granted, let me say I am pro tenant as well too. What I'm not really in favor of is this, this sweeping indictment against landlords, because there's so many things that can get caught up in the nets too, you know? Um, and, and when you, you need to be able to support the tenants and support the people who are paying their rent, but a better plan, you know, cause there's no support for the, the landlord, a better plan might be, well, you know, we'll subsidize 25% of your rent instead of making the landlord reduce their rent. And then all of a sudden they have to eat, you know, this huge chunk of what they might've been expecting for, to put food on their table. Right. Um, and so when you have this big sweeping bill like this, it's not necessarily the best, especially because it's probably against the constitution too, and a California constitution as well. Um, Brad, have you heard of any major organizations coming out against this? Or, I haven't really heard much about it in the news. Is there anything out there about this? Well, I think the one thing that is interesting is that the news isn't talking about it yet. Um, and you know, we're, we're getting notifications from the California Association of Realtors and the Apartment Owners Association, which are obviously pro real estate ownership, mm -hmm. um, just talking about some of the details and how it can have a major impact without supporting those that really own the product. Um, and we talked, you know, Justin, you mentioned subsidies and different things of tenants. Um, this bill really doesn't account for any subsidies. It really is just presuming that the landlords can take the hit mm -hmm. of a 25% reduction and not allowing for evictions. Well, the challenge is in that situation is that, you know, how many months, Jason, does it take to uh, for 25 percent rent reduction to eat up a security deposit or have a have an owner be in a really bad place? And I'll clarify something. A 25 percent rent reduction, the bill does state that they have to repay it. But if they have a 25 percent rent reduction for four months, what happens? And what position is that landlord in from a cash flow perspective and also from an eviction perspective if that, that tenant cannot start making payments to repay? Yeah, it's tough. Uh, first and foremost, 25% is a killer. And, you know, it's one thing to have landlords and tenants come together over a two or three month process and work out something where they do 10 to 20% off or a partial payment plan. I've seen it a lot and it's amazing. But if it's 25%, for a year, like AB 828 proposes a, a court or a judge could do, that's a long time. Average rents here are what, $2,500 roughly in San Diego, for example, and that's quite a bit of money. And so the mom and pops don't have a lot of protection 
they are going to reach for security deposits first, which may to help keep them afloat, but may cause a problem down the line when the tenant actually moves out and that money has to go back. Now the bill does list some remedies for if the payment isn't made, but again, they're a little bit weak. It starts with 48 hours from the time the repayment hasn't been done. You can petition the court again, but we all know those of us who work here in California, it's a while just to get your hearing date, get back to the court. There's nothing fast track. So let's say it takes 45 days if the court is working well and 60 days if it's working not for another hearing. You know, that's a long time to not have mortgages or not have a rent coming in where you, the landlord, still have to make that payment. So as Justin said, we, the devil's in the details and this bill doesn't answer it. And there are other small local jurisdiction moratoriums like the city of San Diego, just as an example, because we're here that have a little more clear cut guidance, ask for a little more documentation. And I, someone just asked in the, one of the group chats, it says, so the 25% isn't completely forgiven. It must be repaid later down the road. And yes, that is correct. Right. I, I've not seen anything about um, an actual permanent reduction with forgiveness on that, because then that would be a, I would have to imagine that's a due process violation uh, because of that. There's no, no, but yeah, yeah. There's, see, this is an interesting constitutional argument as well too. And I just spilled coffee everywhere. Um, and the, the constitutional argument would be that the, the state uh, from a legal side, the state is impeding your ability to enter into a contract or uh, an already executed contract. And so if I come up to an agreement with Jason that says, I'm going to rent this out for $2,000 and the state comes in and now says, nope, it has to be 1500, which is a 25% reduction. That is an impeding on my ability to enter into a contract with Jason. Um, also, there's a due process claim in there too, that uh, they're taking away part of my property, which would be money as a result of it too. So there's, there's a couple of interesting claims there, you know, with the California constitution and the federal constitution. Um, and, and Brad, one of the, uh, what was the example that you gave a couple of weeks ago about what the, my example I thought was a, a, a pretty good one too, not to toot my own horn here, is that it's like going into a restaurant and telling the restaurant owner that they need to reduce their food prices for the consumer by 25%. And then maybe the consumer will pay you later on. I just think that sometimes the, the state thinks that landlords can just take it on the chin and that's probably just not going to be the case jason you work with property owners all the time and i'm assuming that that would just not fly for the majority of the people that you work with right and the bill lays out things differentiates between the one or two only only one or two properties yeah. and you know being at 10 plus, those who are 10 plus cannot show any if you own 10 or more units you're sorry you're subject to this law that's the way it goes so it does differentiate between the type of landlords there are but it's absolutely true, Justin, and Brad can speak to this as well. A lot of first-time investors or even savvy investors, without getting an entire month's rent, they're in trouble. Now take 25% over the next four months. That's a big deal. And oh, by the way, when the water heater goes out and it's $1,200 to repair or you know a major capital improvement is required, what do you do because you don't have that income and maybe the way you set up your pro forma or your planning, it was supposed to be there and now it's not. And then we run into habitability laws. I wanted to fix the water heater, but I can't make all my payments and you're paying me 25% less. I have an economic hardship. What do I do? So that, that's my concern here on some of the, the effects that this bill may have if it became law. Yeah. But I love Jason, the way we, we spoke a couple of weeks back about how you're striking deals between landlords and tenants that have real hardships. There's a lot of landlords out there that are very empathetic with trying to make it work for the tenant, trying to do whatever is best for everyone so that it's a win-win situation. And the challenge here is we're just making a blanket statement. We're saying every tenant can go in and propose that they get 25% off and the landlord doesn't necessarily have a, a fallback. Yeah, they're not gonna be foreclosed upon during a specific window, but that doesn't mean they don't have to repay their payments. And it doesn't mean that they're gonna have a repayment plan with their lender that it's federally backed, like you yeah. mentioned earlier. So the landlord is gonna take on the burden and the tenant is gonna have an out because you know three, four months down the road after they have this reduced payment, there's not gonna be much skin in the game for, for them anymore. And that's the challenge. I mean, I, that's what I see as being really hard here. And I, I want everyone to have a little relief, 
but I think there's a big challenge in, in protecting all parties, making sure and, that everyone's whole. And Justin, let me add in for Brad as well. I think he makes a great point. We have over 2,000 units here. I got to tell you, I've been doing this since 2004. This is the best time I've ever seen relationship-wise between residents and landlords. People are come together to make this work, and I love it. Yes, there are probably a couple of residents out there who may have taken advantage of the opportunity to not pay their rent for now. But for the most part, this is landlords and tenants coming together to find a way to get us through this pandemic, and I love it. And there was no government uh, involvement, at least at our company, it was just like, hey, resident, how can we help? Landlord, this is what we're proposing. And everybody came together to make it work. We're in month two, and we have hard data right now. There's less than 5% of our residents have not been able to make their payment at all. Less than 5%. And less than 22% of all residents uh, had to go on some kind of payment plan or discount. So for the most part, landlords and tenants were able to come together and make the rental payment. And we're going to get through these next, we're at two months left, probably most likely June 1 is probably going to be the last month we're going to see severe hardship, at least in the rental income point before we move on to business as usual for now, knock on wood. So, and that, that kind of brings me to a next question to the state of the market. Um, and Brad, we talked about this two weeks ago. Uh, how has it been? Has it been slowing down? Have you uh, seen a large number uh, of the inventory rising? Uh, is it a buyer's market yet? Is it still a seller's market? Where, where are we at? Well, first I'll, I'll lead with, it's incredibly pocketed mm -hmm. per area. So Makes sense. I'll make a statement. I don't want it to be a blanket statement because every single little detail in each market is going to be different. La Jolla is going to be different than Fallbrook. Mm -hmm. Fallbrook will be different than, you know, San Diego. So um, looking in your specific area, your specific zip code, I think that's really important. Um, you know, what we're seeing is really a reduction in the number of homes coming on the market. So about 50% per week of the homes that were coming on the market, uh, traditionally last year um, versus this year, about 50% reduction. But it's also a 50% reduction in the number of homes that are selling. So inventory is really matching demand in a lot of cases right now. We're seeing people buy homes that need to buy homes that are, that are out there in the market. Um, our team has personally seen an uptick in the number of people that we're helping and the number of referrals that we're receiving during this time. Um, it's, it's been very busy the last two weeks, and I think people are really starting to loosen up with these phases that we're starting to unroll. Um, people want to get out there, and obviously we're taking every precautionary measure to make sure everyone's protected, and also that proper disclosures. I mean, California Association, California Association of Realtors is very quick to come out with a bunch of forms for every single showing that we do to make sure that people aren't sick and that we're not endangering anyone. Um, but uh, it's, you know, it's business as unusual, I guess. I mean, yeah. we're still seeing buyers and sellers do things. We're still putting homes on the market, but the reality is we're just doing it a little bit differently. Yeah. So it's, it's the new, it's within the new normal, uh, the new paradigm, you're still seeing the supply and the demand not really outweighing one another from, it's just overall, I imagine that, and that makes sense too. Last year, you know, we didn't have restrictions, so people would buy and sell as they please. Now maybe they'll think a little bit more about buying and think a little bit more about selling. Uh, Jason, what about people moving out of apartments and condos and houses and whatnot? I imagine, like someone told me the other day they got on a flight. I was like, how did you get on a flight? And I don't know if you guys have done this too. I watched a movie yesterday. I saw someone shake hands with someone. I was like, whoa, guys, let's take it easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. Well. Jason, what what's uh what's it like right now? Are people moving at all? You, you know, surprisingly, it's still very much as Brad said, business as unusual. People need people are coming to the city. People are coming to the county. They need a place to rent. People are um, need a bigger place to live in, so they're going up or they're going down in size. So we've been able to with conservative pricing. We've been able to. Uh, fill our vacancies and we have we got a pretty low number right now we're hovering in the apartment world we're hovering in that you know two to three percent vacancy rate and a lot of that is also due to because not as many people are leaving you would think that people can't make their payment and they're going to leave but in reality a lot of them have found a way to hunker down and try to get to these next couple months before they make that next move yeah. so overall things have looked well from at least a vacancy perspective again We've been very conservative on rent and when it, when it comes to lease renewals, 
we traditionally do year lease renewals, we've been able to provide lease renewals, but give any, give a, I would say an abatement on any kind of rent increase. So if your lease came to an end in May, but you want to extend for a year, we're able to do that and then say, hey, we're not going to do any increases for two to three months. So you can at least get through this period of time before we worry about the rent going up. Okay. Uh, let's see. Uh, Barbara Martin asked, uh, what if the tenant moves out after two to three months of only paying the partial rent, the 75% rent? Uh, what are landlord's steps to try and recover the rent they lost? Barbara, I'll kind of answer that and then you guys can chime in if you'd like to. I think that's going to be a civil matter. You're going to have to bring that into the courts. Um, the court, I imagine this is, got, if, if this law does stay in place, first of all, if it gets voted in, it has not. Um, if it does get voted in and we're at a point where this kind of situation might apply where someone is paying this reduced rent and then decides to vacate, I imagine that the, the new rent would be based on the previous lease, meaning we're not going to sign a brand new lease. Um, or we might actually, it, it really just depends on what the court would decide. But usually I would say the tenant uh, could be, the, the landlord can go after the tenant in civil court like you normally could uh, for unpaid rent. So uh, any of you guys want to chime in on that? I would agree with you. I think that uh, you're right. It's, once they give back possession of the property, it becomes a completely different matter versus a, uh, some kind of writ of restitution or unlawful detainer filing. Yeah. And, you know, small claims court is just uh, a four month venture down the road. I mean, and with the way the courts are now it could be a six month venture. And then you are going to be standing at the mercy of a judge or a pro tem or whatever saying like, well, I don't think you should charge that much. And I'm going to decide however much money you should get back. I know a lot of apartment company, you know, or management companies like ours, that have collection companies, we may turn over that balance to a collection agency, um, yeah. depending on the situation. So, but you know, in the in the interest of being fair too, I I wouldn't see it being far fetched for, uh, and this is not a uh, you know an indictment against the judges or anything. I wouldn't be surprised if they would just say, you know, landlord, just forgive it. You know, uh, it, it happened during the corona and. Y that's kind of the, uh, we'll squash it, you know? That happens all the time though. That's a regular, for anybody who's ever, and you know this better than anybody, I, I'm not an expert by any means, but I've been down there enough times to know that there's no winners in any kind of civil matters. So. Absolutely. Except for Especially the small claims matters. Oh, so. small, small claims, there's no attorneys, but you know, in the, in the uh, other claims, the attorney's usually the winner. And that's what they say. Attorney's the winner, right, right. Um, well, thank you guys for joining. I don't think we have any more questions. Let me check the Facebook. Page. Small claims. Um, doesn't look like it. Uh, any last words, you guys, other than uh, pay your rent? No, thanks for having us on. I really just want to let everybody know out there that as far as from the property management world, and again, Brad is the person who does sales, and, and we here at Golden West Management don't do any sales. We're focused on landlords and tenants. I just want to say that if you're having an issue paying rent, reach out. There's plenty of ways to work together to get something that works for everybody. And again, that's the best win-win I've seen. We've seen landlords give, we've seen tenants give, and it's worked out well for everybody. And I want to thank those landlords and, and tenants that we've been working with. Thank you so much for all that you guys have done. Yeah. And then, um, uh, Brad, any more? Well, I, I think Jason's right on. I think communication right now is key for all parties. We, you have a tenant in place. Um, you're considering not paying your mortgage because you're in a hardship. Um, communicating with the property manager, your tenant, uh, your real estate broker, I think that's a, a key understanding right now yeah. that there are ways to get through it. There are things we can do to, to help out in any way possible. And without the communication and just burying your head in the sand, it's going to be a much bigger problem I agree. Uh, when it shows up later. So have those, have those talks. Yeah. And I think that, you know, as you both mentioned, we're all kind of in this together and a lot of people are, are having hardships. I think the lack of communication will put you in a much tougher spot. If you're unable to pay your mortgage, call, call your company. You know, if you're unable to pay, like student loans were uh, forgiven for like a month or there was supposed to be, you can claim for it. You know, there's a lot of different things you can do. And it's not, this isn't just one person not being able to pay. So there's nothing to be embarrassed about that. And I think that's what Sometimes people get a little like embarrassed, like I can't believe I can't pay. But you know, this is very, this is an interesting time, and we're uh, we're all kind of going through this. Uh, we're stumbling in the dark. It feels like just feeling for you know what's going to come next. So 
Um, Jason, why don't you go ahead and throw your info out there, and then Brad, why don't you throw your info in case anyone has any questions? Absolutely. Uh, Jason Yoss, broker here at Golden West Management. We handle property management for residential properties in San Diego, in Las Vegas, and in Phoenix. Uh, we're happy to handle management business, and we don't do sales, so no stepping on our realtor or affiliates' toes. Okay, what about website and phone number? You can reach us at toll-free 866-545-5303 or find us on the web, goldenwestmanagement.com. All right. And Brad? Uh, it's Brad Seaman with the Seaman team, Keller Williams, uh, serving San Diego County. Uh, we don't do property management because we wouldn't wish that upon anyone. Um, so make sure you send that to Jason <laughs> and don't do it yourself. Um, we, we do residential sales, specializing in uh, property flips, investors, uh, luxury. So... Anywhere in San Diego County, we service, we're about 90% by referral. And uh, I'll make sure to pass along any questions that might come through later on. Uh, make sure if you want, justin at lawyerandbluejeans.com, you can always email me. If you're seeing this on Facebook, make sure to like it and share it or check out um, their Facebook pages. You guys have a Facebook page both that we'll put in the notes as well too, so people can click on it if they wanna check you out. Um, thank you everyone for joining us. We're going to have some good guests on the next couple of weeks. We're going to have a divorce attorney uh, talking about the amount of clients that he's uh, potentially taking on in the next few weeks here. And then um, a CPA that can talk about the CARES Act a little bit and, uh, and what you need to do as far as uh, maybe income for the stimulus that you might have received. So uh, once again, thank you everyone for joining us. This has been the Lawyer in Blue Jeans uh, webinar with Brad Seaman and Jason Yoss and uh, everyone stay safe out there. Thank okay. you. Yeah.